So our next speaker is Peter Asker, and his talk is entitled Tissue-Specific Analysis of Nuclear Organization Through Development of a Novel FLIP, I'm not going to pronounce that acronym, Based Toolkit for Spatiotemporal Control of Gene Expression. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I would like to thank also by starting the organizers for uh, bringing us together this meeting and for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you today. <clears throat> so uh, I'll talk to you about uh, two things. One is uh, how we have identified a nuclear envelope protein called emerin and its role in, in the nervous system in elegance. And second, uh, our current development of a toolkit that I think could be of relevant to, to many people in, in the audience. So uh, the nuclear envelope has, uh, has been recognized or is being recognized as an important organizer for chromatin inside the nucleus. Uh, and as a reflection of that, mutation in nuclear mineral proteins is known to cause a wide variety of human diseases, many of which are known as laminopathies. Uh, to understand uh, how, or how the nuclear mineral is involved in chromatin organization, we use a method called DAM-ID. I'll not go into uh, the details of the methodology, but, but just briefly, uh, we fuse the protein that we want to study with DAM uh, methylase from E. coli, uh, and then through a series of enzymatic reactions, uh, we can then identify the chromatin that's been uh, in touch with the, with the protein. We study, let me see if I find here, we study uh, several different proteins of the nuclear envelope, including emerin, uh, transmembrane protein, uh, lamin, or lamin 1 from the nuclear lamina, as well as several proteins of the nuclear pore complex like MEL28 and MPP22. And just uh, very briefly here, if you compare, for instance, these four different profiles from chromosome 1, we can see that the, the profile of MPP22 is much more similar to, to the lamin and emerin proteins uh, uh, in, in, in comparison with MEL28, uh, suggesting that different nucleopore proteins actually contact different, uh, different uh, parts of the chromatin. Uh, so uh, we focus on emerin because of its role in, uh, to human, uh, human health. Patients uh, or mutations in emerin in human causes this muscular dystrophy uh, called emery dreyfus muscular dystrophy, uh, which is a devastating illness that's fatal to the patients typically in the second decade of life uh, due to heart failure. We also study LEM2 because of its uh, redundant function with emerin in, uh, during early C. elegans hemorrhogenesis. Uh, both proteins, uh, emerin and LEM2, are, are expressed throughout the, uh, the animal, uh, but when we compare them uh, in, inside the same animal, we can see that, for instance, neurons have a higher level of expression of emerin, whereas uh, intestinal cells show more LEM2, for instance. So that suggests that potentially these two proteins might have tissue-specific uh, functions in nuclear, in nuclear organization. That's what we're studying. We started out by doing DAM-ID on, on entire animals, and here we are comparing the profiles of lamin and emerin, and we can see that uh, across three different chromosomes, the profiles are very, very similar. However, zooming in, we start uh, uh, realizing that there are regions where you find, for instance, in this case, binding to emerin, but not any association with, uh, with lamin. And looking genome-wide, we find like 340 what we call emerin-only elements, uh, and go-term analysis of those uh, find uh, a high, represent uh, or, uh, high number of genes related to the nervous system in C. elegans. Um, <clears throat> and we also acquired our data set the other way around by taking genes which are known to ex be expressed in specific uh, tissues, such as, for instance, intestine uh, or in the germline or in ubiquitously expressed genes. And in that case, we see that these genes are typically more associated with, with lamin than they are with emerin but genes which express in the muscle and the nervous system have a higher uh, overall uh, interaction with emerin than with, with lamin. So even though uh, emerin and lamin are both sitting in the nuclear envelope, they do have uh, certain, certain specificities. Uh, not only do we see an uh, increase in inter association of emerin with genes of the nervous system, but we also see changes in expression uh, of many genes when we knock down emerin and, and LEM2 together. In this case here, I'm just showing some of them. We can see how uh, proteins involved in neurotransmitter vesicle recycling, potassium channels, and that's the choline receptor networks are deregulated upon uh, uh, knockdown of emerin and LEM2. So in order to see does this actually have any, any physiological role in the worm, uh, we used a, an assay which is known as the Aldicarb assay, which just very briefly uh, is explained here. So Aldicarb is a small uh, inhibitor of the enzyme choline esterase, uh, which acts to clear away acetylcholine from the synaptic cleft uh, uh, during, uh, during signaling. Now addition of Aldicarb will then trigger a, a hyperstimulation of the muscles and eventually paralysis of the animals. And therefore, uh, paralysis can, or timing of paralysis can be used as a, as a readout for, for neuromuscular junction activity. 
In this graph, you can see how uh, mutants in limb two, so these are non mutants, uh, non mutants of limb two show the same behavior as wild type, that is, that they get paralyzed after around 55 minutes. But limb, uh, immigrant mutants, in contrast, are paralyzed much faster. The half of the population is paralyzed like after 35 minutes, so significantly faster. This assay here uh, cannot discriminate directly by whether the defects are on the pre- or the postsynaptic side uh, uh, of the synapse. So what we did next was to express emerin uh, fused to an M-chair just, just uh, for visualization, specifically in the neurons uh, or specifically in the muscles uh, by MOS single copy integrations. And we can see that uh, in the green here, that would be the one that expresses in, uh, emerin in neurons, that it uh, uh, rescues nicely uh, down to wild-type levels here in blue whereas the one uh, expressing in the muscle has only a partial rescue. So we can really see here that expression only of emerin in the muscle, sorry, in the nervous system can, can rescue the, the phenotypes. The next uh, thing we want to do is now to study the nuclear, uh, nuclear organization specifically in, uh, in the nervous system. Uh, to just briefly here, the DAM-ID technique is based on an extremely low level of expression of the DAM fusions. Uh, we can uh, so we normally use a heat shock promoter, but we, use, uh, we do the DAM-ID experiment without the heat shock. So basically the experimental conditions would be like here, where we can't see our fusion proteins. We can do a heat shock just to visualize the protein, but again here, remember, we're expressing very low levels. So that implies that we cannot simply just take a tissue-specific promoter to drive our DAM-ID fusions, uh, because we would, just, we would get too much expression. So what we're doing instead, or what we've designed instead, is this... Uh, 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 construct visualized here in which we have an FRT flanked uh, m cherry histone cassette sitting upstream of our dam fusion. Uh, so in most cells we will just get very basal expression of m cherry histone. But now in, if we express in specific cells the flip A's, we will then uh, flip out uh, the, the upstream cassette and now in this, in this specific cells we will get basal expression of our, of our dam fusions. Uh, we have done then, uh, we have now six different nuclear proteins uh, uh, under analysis, and we are currently cloning also AMA1, which will allow us to study gene expression, uh, so genes which are uh, uh, associated with RNA pol 2 uh, transcription. So in order to visualize how this system actually works, we have now, we are using here instead of the DAM fusion, we're putting in a GFP histone, uh, and now we also give a heat shock so we can actually see what's going on. <clears throat> We're doing this because we want to do DAM-ID in specific tissues, but we think this toolkit can be also useful for many other approaches, so we've ex extended our, our list of uh, FLIPase-driven promoters uh, extensively, so, so other, other tissues uh, can also be, uh, be addressed. Uh, we have also been optimizing the activity of the FLIPase to get the best uh, or the highest uh, recombination efficiency. I'll not go through all the details here, but basically just say that we ended up uh, uh, going for a, a single copy integration of the flip base here in, uh, in, in this one, uh, which has a, a sp aspartic acid at position five. Uh, we have also, we can also then, if we look at confocal images uh, of animals that have been uh, 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 heat shocked, we can see that, for instance, in the seam cell lineage using the NH82 promoter, we get a lot of yellow cells, uh, which uh, basically tells us that we get recombination of a single, uh, of a single uh, allele, whereas the other allele keeps on expressing uh, histone, uh, red histones. Uh, in contrast, in the, using the RGF1 promoter in the neurons, or for instance, uh, you can't see it here, it says helix, loops helix 8, uh, promoted from the uh, M lineage, we get complete uh, conversion of both, uh, of both alleles, so we get a high specificity and high efficiency here. Uh, we think that this, again, we think that this, this toolkit can be used for more things than just, uh, than, than, than just DAM ID, so what we have cloned in this construct here is a PL1 toxin uh, instead of the DAM fusion protein down here. And now, uh, by combining these, uh, this, this construct together with a, a flip base in a specific tissue, we'll then be able to, at a given time point, uh, induce expression in specific cells and thereby uh, potentially ablate those cells and do functional analysis. Just to illustrate that this actually works, uh, what we've been doing here in this uh, experiment is uh, we induce uh, the expression of PL1 specifically in the uh, in mechanosensory neurons uh, using the MEX7, uh, MEX7 promoter, and that gives a high frequency of uh, mechanosensory uh, uh, defective animals. In contrast, uh, if we express uh, the flibase on the control of a promoter that's active, active in the uh, serotonergic neurons, we get an egg-laying uh, defect uh, shown down here. 
Uh, finally, the, the last uh, example I would like to use for saying what can we use this, uh, this kind of tools for is uh, if we want to have temporal control of low expression, uh, as for instance what we need in the DAMID experiments, uh, we are also now using uh, a, a situation where we have a heat shock promoter to drive expression of the flip base. And we do this because that one, uh, one issue to keep in mind with the DAMID experiments is that the methylates, once it puts on a, met, a, met, a, methionin, sorry, a methylation uh, at the adenine, this mark will is, is stable until DNA replication. So uh, basically, the DAMID experiment is a summary of all the methylation events that have happened through the life of that cell. And if we want to study uh, DAMID uh, or use DAMID to study nuclear organization uh, in aging, we need to make sure that our uh, DAMID is only activated whenever we want it. And I think just to connect it with the previous talk, I think we, this could potentially also even then be combined in a time and, uh, time and uh, uh, temporal manner by doing a, a, a light-induced heat activation in particular cell types, which we haven't explored. Uh, basically, the reason why we want to do that is that, as, as you all know, C. elegans is a powerful uh, model for, uh, to study aging. And nuclear morphology changes dramatically during the aging of the animals. Uh, as shown here, these are, are images of, uh, of cells that express lamin uh, GFP. Uh, but we don't really know what's going on in terms of how, how do these uh, changes in nuclear envelope morphology uh, uh, impact on nuclear organization, if, if they actually impact on nuclear organization. And that's what we would like to, would like to address. Uh, this is just to show uh, that the approach works in the sense of without any heat shock, we have no expression of the GFP histone. After a one heat shock, uh, we get, uh, of course, strong activation of the M-cherry histone, as we expect, and we start getting weak. I don't know if you can, probably know, you can't even see it on the, on, on the slide here, but there's a weak expression now of the GFP histone. And if we now do a second heat shock, we get strong expression of the GFP histone. So basically that tells us that, uh, that we do get a certain activation or we get sufficient activation of the flipase after one heat shock, so we will start getting the recombination that we want to get our DAMID fusion uh, genes placed after the heat shock promoter, but we don't get an overactivation. So we don't, we're, not, we're not inducing a, 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 a you know, very high expression of our DAM fusion. Uh, so basically that takes me to the, to the uh, summary slide here. So in the first part, part I briefly went through some, some results we have where uh, we've seen how neuronal genes are associated uh, with emerin, uh, and that deletion of emerin and limb 2 causes uh, uh, extensive deregulation of gene expression, including in, in the nervous system. And uh, we can rescue defects of uh, physiological defects in the, in the neurons uh, by expressing emerin specifically in that tissue. We are developing this toolkit, which I think is in, uh, uh, interesting also in the context of the previous talk, and I think also the next talk will give us another uh, ver uh, possibilities of what can we do with, the, with temporal, spatial temporal control of gene expression. Uh, and also we can combine this with systems that have been developed and, and published already in, in other systems here, and I, I hope that will be, be useful for many labs. And finally, I would like to thank everyone in my lab for, for their uh, uh, many efforts and, and high motivation that they continue to uh, uh, demonstrate particular I would like to point out here is Thalia and uh, uh, where is he? Uh, she, he is here, Christina, uh, the two that have been directly Im uh, implemented in the work I've been telling you today. Uh, Katharina Gathier from our institute helps on the microscopy, Peter Meister and Dominique Riedler in, in University of Bern helps us on, on the DAMID analysis and Nuria Flamis for uh, help on our suggestions on the nervous system uh, analysis and with that thank you much for your attention. That was really cool. Uh, I'm going to just ask you about something that's not really central to your presentation, but I noticed this really striking effect of general chromosomal position on the DAM ID signal. And if I understood it right, the ends of the chromosomes have a lot stronger interaction with the nuclear lamina than the centers. Yes. And the centers, as we know, are generally where the essential kind of more ubiquitously expressed genes tend to be. So I'm just wondering if you've thought about sort of global patterns of gene regulation and how they might be orchestrated by nuclear interaction. I mean, that was um, this, this uh, preferential association of the chromosome arms with the nuclear periphery was first uh, de uh, described by, uh, in the Jason Leap's lab uh, by Kota Ikegami uh, by doing a uh, uh, chip uh, with LEM2. And they also see a correlation with, uh, with gene expression and uh, they, 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 they also propose how some genes in the chromosome arms loop out uh, to become active there, but, but there's a general uh, observation on that. 
Cool. Thanks.